الحمد للہ الحمد للہ وحد لا شریک له والصلاۃ والسلام علی من لا نبی بعد اما بعد In our previous session, we were discussing the great miracle which has been granted to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which each and every one of us can relate to not only in this day and age but those who come until the final day will also be able to relate to this miracle of the glorious Qur'an granted to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whilst discussing the glorious Qur'an being divine, the glorious Qur'an being a message of the greater being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned a challenge. And this challenge was that the humankind and the jinn kind should all come together in order to produce a like of the glorious Qur'an. Whilst giving this challenge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentioned لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ that the ins and the jinn kind وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا despite aiding, assisting and supporting one another will never be able to produce a like of the glorious Qur'an. The question was, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know that no one within the future will be able to fulfill this challenge which relates to producing a like of the glorious Qur'an? Now let me rephrase this question. And the reason I'm going to rephrase this question is that during these sessions of ours, through the grace and through the assistance of Allah Ta'ala, we will hear the answers to many objections. I will phrase these objections with a certain wording. We will hear the answers to them. It's possible someone presents the same objection but in a slightly different wording. We shouldn't think that this is a new objection. We should understand it's the same old objection we have heard an answer to, but the wording has been changed slightly. So many a people question, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know whether Sayfuddin is going to experience eternal success or failure in the hereafter? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know when Sayfuddin is going to leave this world? In simple terms, how does Allah Ta'ala know what's going to happen in the future? How does Allah Ta'ala have eternal knowledge? The reason for why we have this question is because once it comes to our knowledge, our knowledge is very limited. Our knowledge is limited and confined, restricted to that which we see before ourselves. If there's anything which is behind a wall, then we lack knowledge with regards to it. We try to think of the knowledge of Allah Ta'ala in the light of our knowledge, which is a great mistake within itself. Let's take an example on board in order to understand the answer to this question. We've got an individual who manufactures a car. After this individual has manufactured a car, this car is then sent out onto the road to be driven by those who purchase that particular vehicle. Those who purchase this particular vehicle they will only be aware of that part and that aspect of the vehicle they have before their naked eyes. Zaid has bought this particular vehicle. He's gone to the showroom to pick up this vehicle. The vehicle is parked in a manner that he sees the front of the vehicle first. He is unable to see either side of the vehicle, nor can he see the rear of the vehicle. 
due to him only being able to visualize the front of the vehicle, his knowledge will be limited to the front of the vehicle. He can tell people whether the front screen is tinted or not. He will be able to tell people whether the car has any modifications on the front or not. Why? Because he can see the front of the vehicle. Once it comes to the rear of the vehicle, due to him not being able to visualize the rear of the vehicle, he cannot describe the rear of the vehicle to those around him. When questioned with regards to whether the rear window of the car is tinted or not, he cannot respond. Once he is questioned with regards to whether there is a spoiler on the back of this vehicle, he is unable to respond. In other words, Zaid who purchases this vehicle, he can only describe or make mention of that part of the vehicle he has before himself, that part of the vehicle he has not yet come across, he cannot describe that to others. Why? Because he lacks knowledge with regards to that part of the vehicle. On the other hand, once we look towards the individual who manufactured this vehicle, due to him being the manufacturer of this vehicle, the front, the back, the right, the left, the top and the bottom of this vehicle are all equal to him. In what sense? Once it comes to his knowledge with regards to these various parts of the vehicle. When anyone questions him, with regards to the front of the vehicle, he will have knowledge regarding it why he is the manufacturer. When someone questions him with regards to the rear, the back of the vehicle, again he will have knowledge with regards to it why? Because he is the manufacturer. And I will go on to say that due to him being the manufacturer, he will have knowledge with regards to every part of this vehicle he has manufactured. Once it comes to the creation of Allah Ta'ala, once it comes to time, once it comes to space, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the creator of time, space and the entire creation. If a manufacturer of a vehicle has total knowledge with regards to his manufactured, manufactured product, why does the creator of time, space and the creation not have total information and knowledge with regards to his creation. This is the reason for why Allah Ta'ala created time. In time we have according to our understanding the past, the present and the future. Allah Ta'ala created time which consists of all three tenses due to which Allah Ta'ala has information with regards to each one of the three tenses, it's not only that Allah Ta'ala has information with regards to occurrences of the past or current occurrences, Allah Ta'ala also has knowledge with regards to future occurrences. Why do we not have knowledge with regards to future occurrences? And we only have knowledge with regards to current present occurrences and occurrences of the past is because we are not the creators of time. Whatever we come across in the form of time is that which we have knowledge with regards to. And I mentioned that people try to judge the knowledge of Allah Ta'ala based upon our knowledge. This is equivalent to trying to judge the knowledge of Zaid with regards to a car manufactured by a particular manufacturer in accordance with the knowledge of the manufacturer or vice versa. This is the reason for why Allah Ta'ala never only gave the challenge La yatuna bimithlihi Due to having created time, Allah Ta'ala has knowledge with regards to occurrences of the future he already declared that no one will be able to fulfill this challenge of the glorious Qur'an. No one can ever produce a like of the glorious Qur'an. This was challenge number one. The entire Qur'an try to produce something like it. People in the time of the Prophet wasallam exerted their efforts. They were unable to do so. 
Allah Ta'ala wanted the people to know that the glorious Quran is a great miracle. It's possible if Allah Ta'ala only gave the challenge of produ producing a like of the glorious Quran, someone may have turned around and mentioned that we cannot produce a like of the entire glorious Quran, but it's possible we can produce a like of a part of the glorious Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was about to make them even more helpless. He was about to prove them to be even more unable. The second challenge then came. فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ مُفْتَرَيَاتِ That bring about ten chapters like ten chapters of the glorious Qur'an. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in apparent, in accordance with our understanding, made this challenge somewhat easier. But remember, it's still impossible. Why? Just as people were unable to bring a like of the entire glorious Qur'an, they will be unable to bring ten chapters like ten chapters of the glorious Qur'an as well. وَدْعُوا مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ And bring all those you call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to fulfill the second challenge of Allah ta'ala which is to bring forth ten chapters like ten chapters of the glorious Qur'an. Again, people exerted the effort. They were unable to do so. Allah Ta'ala then gave the final third challenge. And this final third challenge made them realize that we are totally helpless in trying to produce anything like any portion of the glorious Quran. This final challenge was that فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ Leave bringing something like the entire Qur'an. Leave producing ten chapters like ten chapters of the glorious Qur'an. Now simple challenge. Bring forth one chapter like a chapter of the glorious Qur'an. Once we look towards the glorious Qur'an, we have certain chapters which are very small in size. People normally try to recite these in order to bring the prayer to an end quickly. For example, we've got Surah Al-Ikhlas. Very short. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدٌ لَمْ يَلِدُ وَلَمْ يُولَدُ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدٌ Another very short chapter. In the form of Surah Al-Kawthar. إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرُ فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرُ how short are these chapters of the glorious Qur'an? And a final third I will give an example of is Surah Al-Asr Wal-Asr Inna al-insana lafi khusr Illa al-ladheena amanu wa amilu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr These are chapters of the glorious Qur'an which are very very short Allah Ta'ala when giving this final challenge does it mention that bring forth one chapter like a long chapter of the glorious Quran. If the challenge was bring forth one chapter like the longest chapter of the glorious Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, then someone may have turned around and said that we cannot fulfill this challenge but it's possible we can bring around a chapter like a short chapter of the glorious Quran Allah Ta'ala left the challenge open. He never restricted it. He left it totally general. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ Never mind bringing a book like the entire glorious Qur'an. Never mind bringing forth ten chapters like ten chapters of the glorious Qur'an. Now the challenge is bring forth one chapter like one chapter of the glorious Qur'an. And when giving this challenge Allah Ta'ala mentioned, فَإِن لَمْ تَفَعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفَعَلُوا You will never be able to fulfill this challenge of the glorious Qur'an. I've explained one way through which we can understand why Allah Ta'ala in advance has already mentioned that no one can fulfill this challenge of the glorious Qur'an. In other words, no one can prove this glorious Qur'an is human speech. Rather, everyone will have to accept 
that this glorious Quran is divine, it is a message of the greater being, the necessary being, the initial cause of our existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me explain this to you in a slightly different manner now. Once we look towards those in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who were present when this challenge was issued within the era of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, their understanding, their knowledge of the Arabic language was great. They were very high up in the eloquency. They had peaked once it came to the Arabic language. Once it came to poetry, they used to compete with each other in Arabic poetry. This was the level of eloquency in the Arabic language. When such individuals were given such an instruction and they were unable to fulfill this challenge given by Allah Ta'ala, now the level of the Arabic language has fallen. It has gone very low. How can people now think they are able to fulfill that challenge of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? How great was the Arabic of the people in that time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Let's understand this point. Whenever Allah Ta'ala grants a Prophet of His a miracle, it is in order to compete with the expertise of the experts within that particular era and generation. We look towards the time of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah Ta'ala gave Musa alayhi salatu wasalam a staff. Why was a staff given to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam? In order for Musa alayhi salatu wasalam to compete with and eradicate the magic of those individuals who thought they were the greatest to step foot upon the earth once it came to magic. We look towards the time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. He was granted the miracle of curing individuals. Why? Because people in the time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam took pride in the medicine. Once we look towards the miracle the Prophet wasallam was given in the form of the glorious Qur'an. This was due to people in the time of the Prophet wasallam having pride in the Arabic language and having mastered the Arabic language. If they were unable to fulfill this challenge of the glorious Qur'an, then who will be able to fulfill this challenge of the glorious Qur'an in this day and age? فَإِلَّمْ تَفَعَلُوا when people in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were unable to fulfill this challenge, وَلَن تَفَعَلُوا Then people who have not reached their level of eloquence in the Arabic language, coming till the Day of Judgment, they will never be able to fulfill this challenge of the glorious Qur'an in trying to produce something like the glorious Qur'an. This is the glorious Qur'an. And this is the evidence of the divinity of the glorious Qur'an. If this glorious Qur'an was not divine, then someone would have been able to produce a like of the glorious Qur'an. When it's not within the human capacity to bring forth anything like the glorious Qur'an, this within itself is an evidence that the glorious Qur'an is divine in nature and this glorious Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not going to go into detail with regards to this challenge. I could have gone into detail that what's the criteria in order to meet this challenge of the glorious Quran. This criteria can, found, can be found within the glorious Quran itself. Why am I not going to go towards the criteria when the experts were unable to fulfill this challenge and live up to the criteria of this challenge, then what will the non-experts compared to the experts back in that day and age be able to do once it comes to fulfilling this challenge of the glorious Qur'an? I normally give an example in this regard. I say once it comes to the English language, we go back in time, we had Shakespeare. His couplets are known to be great. If Shakespeare in his time 
put forth a challenge that is anyone able to compete with my poetry? That challenge was given at a time. This is a hypothetical scenario. This challenge was given at a time in which people took pride in their English language. People were very eloquent once it came to the English language. People were experts in the English language. When people in that day and age were unable to fulfill this challenge, then who thinks an individual in this day and age will be able to fulfill that challenge? We can make the same example relevant to the challenge of the glorious Quran. When it wasn't fulfilled in that era, it's not going to be fulfilled in this era. And as languages deteriorate further and further, it will never be met until the Day of Judgment. Now there's another question, and this brings us to our second question. Just because no one cannot bring forth a message like the message of the glorious Qur'an, doesn't necessarily mean the glorious Qur'an is divine. It's possible. The Prophet ﷺ was the most educated. It was due to him being the most educated, was he able to present a message no one else was able to equal. To explain this objection, let me mention an example to yourselves. There's a contest taking place within a particular hall. And this context relates to who is the greatest in articulating a speech. This contest comes to an end and the winner is Zaid. Zaid was able to articulate his speech in a manner no one else was able to articulate their speech. Will this now necessarily mean that this individual Zaid he has been assisted externally or is it possible Zaid was the most articulate from amongst them due to which Zaid was able to articulate his speech in a manner no one else were able to articulate their speech this second objection now is that okay no one else is able to present anything similar to the glorious Quran but how does this necessarily mean the glorious Quran is divine? Is it not possible the Prophet ﷺ was the most educated due to which the Prophet ﷺ was able to present a message no one else was able to compete with? Once it comes to the answer to this objection, there's a few very important points we need to understand. And in understanding these points, there are one or two additional discussions I want to mention before yourselves. And the reason for this is that I'm going to discuss historical accounts. I'm going to discuss Islamic accounts. When we normally mention Islamic accounts, people question their reliability. Similarly, when we make mention of historical accounts, then people believe them. We need to understand the reality. Historical accounts are nothing in comparison to Islamic accounts. If there are any accounts which are to be taken as reliable accounts, authentic accounts, they are Islamic accounts, they are not historic accounts. Similarly, many a people claim that they only believe in that which they can understand in the light of science. Can historical accounts be understood in the light of science? And if no, then why do those people who claim to only believe in that which they can understand through science accept historical accounts? Insha'Allah ta'ala, the, the answer to this second objection, we will look towards this in our next session. I pray and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He grants us the ability to enhance our belief in the glorious Qur'an and thereafter also fulfill the remainder of the rights of the glorious Qur'an.
وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين